Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Josh, can I ask you to close the door back there? Thank you very much. <coughs> we start a new series uh, that I've entitled The Christian Disciple. We'll be looking at Christian discipleship over the next few Sundays. And this is part one of The Christian Disciple. Mark chapter 1. Verse 17. It's all you'll be needing to find today. Maybe one other verse in 2 Timothy. Uh, as you're turning, let me pray. Father, we have a lot to do. A lot to do for you in this world. You expect a lot, and many Christians don't really understand that. So I pray that during this series that we'll understand more fully what a Christian disciple is and what you expect of each and every one of us in this room and of all Christians around the world. You've got high expectations and we need to find out what those expectations are. So we will, through your word, we're confident of that and we pray for your blessings upon this time we spend together and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's more to the Christian life than just believing in Jesus. There's a whole lot more. Uh, what is expected of us after we believe in Jesus? Have you thought about that? Do we just place our faith in him for salvation and then sit on the sidelines doing nothing and biding our time until we go to heaven? No, of course, that's the answer to that. We are all called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Christ. What is a disciple? Well, you're going to get the best nutshell definition that you'll ever get in Mark chapter 1 verse 17. It is a great verse here. In chapter 1 verse 17, Jesus told Simon and Andrew these words, Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Brief statement, but packed. A lot in that statement. Because through that statement, we learn what a disciple is. Three things, write these down, or it's on the screen, that we're going to look at today very simple. Disciples learn, they grow, and they go. A disciple learns, grows, and goes. Learns, grows, and goes. A disciple learns about Christ. Jesus said, follow me. Follow me to learn from me. Disciples grow to be more like Christ. He said, I will make you to become. I will make you become something. And then disciples go. He said, I'm going to make you to be fishers of men. You're going to go after souls. That's what a Christian disciple is. You'll never find a better definition in the Bible than this. So let's take a look at this and break this down to those, those three. First of all, a disciple of Jesus Christ learns. Then Jesus said to them, follow me. Follow me. The learning curve begins the moment we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We begin a journey of learning that will last our whole lifetime. It doesn't end. But let's look first at the meaning. What is a disciple? We don't use that word, word too much in our uh, society. Disciple. But what is it? Well, the word basically means a student, a pupil, a learner. When Jesus said, follow me, he was calling people to literally follow him as a student of his teachings and an observer of his character. That's what it means to be a disciple. And back then, especially with religious teachers, it meant that you literally followed them around full time. To learn from them, to learn about them, to observe them and learn from their teaching. And as Christians, we are Christ followers, Christians, who are seeking to know all we can about him and what he teaches. Are we not? That is our goal. Well, we're going to learn from the greatest teacher ever. Jesus is the greatest teacher ever. No one can surpass him. And he taught in different ways. He taught just 12 people at a time, Matthew 5, 1. He taught his small group. That's one way he taught. He, he taught great multitudes, Matthew 5, 1 also. He taught a lot of people at one time. 
He taught in the synagogues whenever he had a chance. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through 22. He would go to the synagogues and teach. He taught in many different ways, and they, they knew that he was the greatest teacher because they said no one has taught like this man has taught. They'd never heard anything like it because it was God. God in the flesh. Therefore, he is the greatest teacher of all. Do we have a passion to really learn from him? Are we really pursuing discipleship every day of our lives? We've got to ask ourselves that question. I have the opportunity to learn from the greatest teacher of all. Am I doing that? How do we learn? Well, the Bible teaches us about Jesus. We can't physically follow Jesus around, but we can follow him in the Bible, can't we? And he is also called the Word. So any part of Scripture can refer to him. It, it is really our textbook. And just make a note of you know, 2 Timothy. Now I'm going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. You know these words so well. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally that means all Scripture is God-breathed. Theonoustos. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's the power the scripture has over our life and we need to be learning the scriptures. Now there are at least seven ways that we can take in the Bible. Let me give you seven. There's more than this, but I just want you to think to stir, stir your thought processes here this morning. Uh, first, how can we get it into us? Uh, number one, we can hear it. You're hearing it right now. You're hearing the Word of God being preached. That's only one way, though, that we intake it. If we can listen to it be, uh, I'm sorry, the first one is we hear it being read, and then secondly, we can hear it being taught. You remember the guy, Alexander, I can't remember his last name, he used to read the Bible, and you could, he had a great baritone voice. He was one, or scurvy, or scorby, something like that. He was great to, to read the Bible. So that's one way. Then you hear it being taught, number two. Then you can read it yourself, just sitting down, just you and God, reading the Bible. That's another way we put it in. A number, another way is discussing it. I, I miss the Sunday school hour, at least especially when I taught the Sunday school class, of having that interaction of discussing the Bible together and reading that. It's a great way uh, to learn and input it in the, in, into your brain. To study it. Now that means studying it by yourself with a concordance out, reading over back and forth and using the study Bible and so forth. We'll go into that uh, later in another message. Memorizing it. Memorizing scripture is a great way to get it in your brain. Uh, so that it can help us in our quest for discipleship. And then here's one that you may not think of. But number seven is to teach other people. If you ever become a teacher of any way, of any, any sort, a small group, Sunday school class, or just at home, you know, and you're teaching someone else, in order to teach them, you've got to really know what you're teaching, and it helps you to learn more, even deeper when you do teach. So it helps. If we barely do these things, can we call ourselves a student of Christ? a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ. The Bible tells us how. We have the Bible and that's enough for us. Well, let's go on. The disciple of Christ grows. Follow me and I will make you become. I will make you become. It indicates growth and maturity. The goal of our growth is to become more Christ-like. We start as babes in Christ, but God wants us to grow up. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. It plainly tells us the Bible is the fertilizer that makes us grow as disciples. Now this takes discipline. It's not just going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen on its own. It takes discipline. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, make a note, says, Exercise yourself toward godliness. Exercise yourself toward godliness. We get the English word gymnasium from the Greek word translated exercise. Believe it or not. To grow as a disciple of Christ takes discipline and training the same way athletes train to get better. Over and over again. Just as an athlete puts in 
time in the gym. We must put in time to learn about Christ and learn how to be a disciple. It takes attendance to church. It takes study on our own. It takes just reading the Bible through over and over again. It takes constant effort. Are we disciples? Are we students of Christ? We all have to answer that for ourselves this morning. Are we really? Also, we see that growth, it's a process. It's a process. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we are being transformed into the same image. We are being transformed into the same image, of course, of Christ. Being transformed indicates an ongoing process. We've got to be patient. You don't get saved and, you, and, come, and come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, then automatically you're a disciple of Christ. It doesn't happen that way. It's a process. Two truths we must keep in mind. First of all, growth has to be pursued, though. It has to be pursued. An athlete does not get muscles just by going to the gym. They go to the gym and sit down and watch everybody else work out. Do they get anything? <clears throat> no, one has to pick up the weights <clears throat> and do the reps. We must have a desire for spiritual growth or it's never going to occur. Also, growth is a lifelong process. It takes discipline to stay the course. We have to be in it for the long haul, this thing called discipleship. We don't just pass Christianity 101 and then that's it. No, it's lifelong. And of course, this growth, <coughs> excuse me, is caused by the Holy Spirit. And if we were to look, and we've looked at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, uh, a few times, so I'm not going to turn there. But you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, you know, long-suffering, and so forth. I know that bottle of water will come in handy eventually. It is the Holy Spirit who begins to develop godly character. The moment we're born again, as this spiritual fruit develops, we become more and more like Jesus Christ if we learn to live the Spirit-filled life. The Holy Spirit wants us, wants to weed out sin and develop and cultivate righteousness. We must ask Him to do so, as we've alluded to in the previous messages, and yield to His leading. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Thirdly, the disciple of Christ goes. Goes. Follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. To be fishers of men, Christians must go to where lost people are. A fisherman can learn all he wants to about fishing from a book, but he will never catch any fish unless he goes fishing. Now please get the last of this. Very important. Disciples are meant to make disciples. If you don't learn anything today, please learn that. Disciples of Jesus Christ are meant to make other disciples. And if I were to go and read from Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's our marching orders as a Christian. The ultimate goal of learning about Christ and growing more like Christ is to teach others to do the same. This is how the early church grew. And this is how healthy churches today are growing. And I've been doing some research. You know, a lot of our larger churches are growing through transfer growth. As people that come from other churches and they, they grow and they but it's not through people becoming Christians and then being discipled and then going to reach other people themselves. That's the ideal goal, you see. People telling other people about Jesus is the first step. Once they believe they need to be taught how to become a disciple of Christ. We used to call this in the Baptist church discipleship training. Or Recently, we've had the new members class, which I think needs to be expanded and improved to do this. So disciples are meant to make other disciples. 
And also, as we are going, we need to set a good example as we're doing this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. New disciples need mature disciples to emulate. I remember as a new Christian, I learned a lot about Christianity by the examples people set before me as I started in a church setting. And this happened in several ways. You, as I tell my story, uh, you think about your story too. I know thoughts are going to come to your mind after you became a Christian and you started going to church. How, how did I learn? Well, I learned how to pray. I had no idea how people prayed. You know, at all. So as I heard people pray, I, I would start saying the language they said, you know, maybe as a brand new Christian. I didn't exactly know how. I learned how to give. I heard lessons and sermons on tithing and how God honors tithing. And I knew to talk to people who tithe and, and it, God really does bless it and so forth. I, I learned how to worship. You know, people worship in all kinds of different ways, you know, and, and the, the, I didn't know anything about worship. I didn't know you could raise your hand, clap your hands, holler, you know, or not, or be silent or whatever. I learned that, didn't you? From You learn it from others. I learned how to study from people who knew the Bible and, and loved to study the Bible, especially uh, as I went to seminary and, and learned to, from people there how important study was. I learned how to witness. I, I, I went on a visitation team every Tuesday night. Went out into the neighborhoods back in the mountains and went to people's homes. It's hard to do that now. You can't do it now with COVID, but I mean, even in our day now, people don't trust people anymore like that. But I learned how to witness door to door like that. I learned how to, to serve in various places in the church by watching other people serve, didn't you? You, you saw them serving the capacity that you were serving in, and you learned from them. I learned righteous attitudes, and I learned how to talk, you know, Christianese. You know, so you, you, these terms that Christians use, we've got to be careful of some because unbelievers aren't familiar with them, and, and I would start talking the way that those around me talked. You see, we have to be a good example. Whether we realize it or not, other Christians are watching us, especially new Christians. We're being model, are we being model students of Christ, each of us? Are we laying down a good pattern? And then finally, discipleship takes total commitment. I want you to listen to what Jesus said. He said this in Luke chapter 14, verse 33. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. I'd say that's total commitment, don't you? The Lord expects us to be his disciples 24-7, not just on Sunday. In Jesus' eyes, there's no such thing as a part-time disciple. So we have to ask ourselves, are we committed to full-time learning? Remember what a disciple is, a learner. Are we committed to full-time growing? Are we committed to full-time going? Paul Powell, in his book, The Complete Disciple, described this condition. I think you'll always remember this once I read this. Because it cut me to the heart when I read this. You're going to remember it too. He said, many churches today remind me of a laboring crew trying to gather in for a harvest while they sit in the tool shed. They go to the tool shed every Sunday and they study how to be bigger and use better methods of agriculture. They study how to sharpen their hoes, grease their tractors, and then they get up and go home. Then they come back on Sunday night, grease their tractors, study how, how to be uh, better planters and better methods of agriculture. Then they go home, don't do anything. Then they come back on Wednesday, Wednesday night, they grease their, uh, sharpen their hose, grease their tractors, and get up and go home. Listen to what he says. They do this week in and week out, year in and year out, and nobody ever goes out into the fields to gather the harvest. I said, that is us. And it hurt. It hurt. Because How do I know that's us? Because if all of us, including me, if we were all really serious about the harvest, now I know these are special times now. It's hard to get people to church. But in, the, in regular times, our church would be full, would it not? If all of us were going and talking to people about Jesus, and telling them the good news and so forth. 
So that's why I say we must make sure this does not happen. We have to do more than just learn about discipleship. We have to practice being real disciples and real followers of Jesus Christ. So we have to each ask, are we learning, growing, and going? That is the goal. Let's pray together. Father, forgive us for uh, our inaction. Forgive us for not taking discipleship seriously. Learning all about it, but never doing it. Learning all about it, but never practicing it. So I pray that you'll challenge all of us, and not everybody's here from our church, but those who are here, that you'll challenge us to improve, 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 and keep on pressing on to be the, uh, a follower and a student of you in these three areas. And we pray for our church. These are unprecedented times and extremely hard to try to find, get someone to come to a church nowadays. Uh, but we pray for the future, and we pray that you'll show us unique ways, especially through social media and online, uh, that we can reach out during these times. Uh, we pray for safety, and we pray for your will to be done in our lives and in the life of our church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you have a great and wonderful week?